thank you. We have heard so much uh, already about the importance of elections, about the quality of elections. We've been joined by extraordinary, courageous people who have been on the front lines, boots on the ground, as Julia said, um, in American elections. We're going to expand the aperture a little bit to talk about what does it mean, what do American elections mean to two people who have been engaged both in the United States but certainly in many, many corners around the world. And it's going to be an opportunity for us to also look at what does it mean for American elections as we're looking to the model that it serves to other countries and the impact that it has as the United States goes around the world to do what the Bush Institute and many other organizations are doing, which is supporting democracy and freedom around the world. So I cannot think of two better people to have this conversation with, um, two patriots, two public servants, two democracy and freedom advocates. So thank you both for being here. Um, Condi, let me start with you. As you have served as Secretary of State and in many other positions and you look around the world, let's just start with what is the importance of an election, really, to a democratic process? Absolutely. Well, first let me thank uh, the Bush Institute. Let me thank uh, President and Mrs. Bush uh, for hosting us again. And it's a real joy and honor just to share the stage with you, uh, Natan. Elections are the only way that the people can express themselves. And whenever I hear, well, elections don't equal democracy, I say that's absolutely right. But without elections, you also can't have a democracy. And so I think we have to recognize uh, that what we are doing with elections is to allow people to have voice. Now, in some places, elections are rigged. Or uh, I remember in the last election in Iraq, Saddam Hussein, I think, won by 99.9% uh, in that election, complete coincidence. <laughs> but uh, when we talk about democratic elections, we are talking about that moment when the people decide who will govern them. And there is no more dignified for human beings, the human, uh, dignified way for human beings to live than to have a say in who will govern them. It's a time at which uh, those who would wish to govern put themselves before uh, their citizens and say, here is how my election will affect your life. It's a time for mobilization of people who have similar views or similar interests. I often tell my students at Stanford, I, I want you to work in a campaign. <laughs> I want you to work for an election because it's when you see democracy at the grassroots, when you see somebody knocking on 50,000 doors as the young black mayor of Birmingham, Alabama did in order to get himself uh, elected, it gives you a sense of the energy of democracy. And uh, my great friend George Schultz always wore a tie that said, uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. Well, at the time of elections, we get to show that democracy is not a spectator sport. And so uh, I think there's a reason that election day uh, carries such weight uh, in every democratic society. Excellent, thank you. Natan, same question to you, and we're delighted to have a non-American voice in this conversation too. Just if you can also speak from your experience, just the importance of elections in a process and, and also in seeing it in countries where it has not always been taken for okay. granted as we often uh, my first elections in my life, when I was 20 years old, were in the Soviet Army. It was for one month, I was, a student was sent to training courses. And, well, what is the election in the Soviet Union? Everybody, uh, all the names are written on the paper, which you simply have to put. But because it is secret ballot, so there is special room. If somebody wants to write some other name, he can go in this room. So, but in the Army, <laughs> the competition is which regiment, which will be the first to report that all 100% voted. <laughs> so our commander made sure that all of us, like 100 soldiers, will come at six in the morning when it is opened. And he said, you have 30 minutes, everybody has to go. And we went quickly, quickly to vote. One person, symbol of curiosity, went for a second to this room to show. He immediately got one week of cleaning the toilets. Hmm. Because, because the commander now could not, he could report, but who knows, and if he changed something, he, he will be fired. So, in fact, then after when I had normal elections, not in the army, I thought it's more or less all the same. People look at this as simply something that they have to do, because if they will not come, authorities will know that they didn't vote, and who knows how it can influence on your career. But there was, 
No, that's the first one. It's like everything else what you're doing in order to keep your life going. In Israel, elections, it's like a whole, first of all, it's free day. Mm -hmm. uh, and people, uh, people feel that it, they are part of the, this country, that they are involved, that they, person, well, they are very, we have many parties, so people are very angry that my wife is not voting like me or something like this, <laughs> but, uh, but everybody feels that he's part of this. So on personal level, as I would say, it's this feeling of your, uh, your personal possession, you're part of this company. On what is much more important, what it means for the leaders, because from my experience, and you could hear some names maybe here, you can think that the characters among the leaders of dictatorships mm. and leaders of free world Sometimes are the same. So what is the difference? They really, no, also, what is the same? They all want to be in power as long as possible. But what is the difference? Here, democracy, not to be in power, you have to, to make the uh, electorate feel good. You are dependent on the electorate. Look, uh, every day on American TV, whether it is CNN or Fox, it's another poll or whether uh, President fulfilled his obligation or not, is he like, so it's, it's one day elections, but it's all every day test for you and you're looking for the ways how to convince uh, your, your electorate. Uh, dictatorship, of course, it's opposite. Uh, electorate uh, depends on you. And the last thing which I want to say from my experience, elec elections is the greatest tool for integration of the society. In Israel, we have people from all the world Mm -hmm. There came one million Soviet Jews. You can, in, in few years, you can imagine what it means for the country of eight million people. So there was a lot of uh, bad mouthing, a lot of competition, a lot of irritation. Everybody wanted them, but not when they start competing with you. And at some moment, we were, I, we as the leaders of this immigration wave, we said we have to start uh, to stop defending ourselves, that we are not liars, that we are not mafia, that we are not this, this. We simply, we said, let's, f for one election, we ask you only for one election, don't vote left and right. Vote for those who will be re uh, representing the interests of uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. And that's how, uh, for one election, we got seven mandates. It's a lot. To the, our prime minister today has seven mandates. So, and the moment representatives of new immigrants and veteran Israelis were sitting together in municipalities, in the government, uh, in Knesset, they have to accept, even if he is part of the mafia, but it's our mafia. If he's, <laughs> we, we, have to, we have to come to agreement. It's democratic. It happened to be the great tool of integration. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, I think it's so important for Americans to also hear the stories of people who have lived without the right to vote yeah. and have really felt and experienced that. If, if I could just add yeah, something please. else. There was a time in our country yeah. where people lived without the right to vote. Yeah. So we have to remember that. Yes. Um, my own experience with elections is kind of interesting in that regard. So uh, my father and my mother met in uh, 1952. They were both teaching. Uh, and they went down to, uh, to register to vote. And uh, my mother was very pretty, and the man, the poll tester, said to her, uh, you, what do you teach? She said, American history. She taught English. <laughs> he said, uh, you probably know who the first president of the United States was. She said, yes, George Washington. He said, you pass. He looked at my father, built like a football player, huge man. He said, how many beans are in this jar? Mm -hmm. oh. And of course, my father didn't know. My father was devastated, so he went back to his church and an old elder said, oh, Reverend, I'll show you how to get, uh, get re registered. He said, uh, now, there's a woman down there, and she's a Republican, <laughs> and she's trying to find anybody in Alabama who will register as a Republican. <laughs> She said, so you go down there and you tell them you're a Republican and she'll register you. Oh, wow. And sure enough, she did. And my dad is, was Republican until the day he died. Wow. So <laughs> I, I, I just have to remind us that it wasn't always easy to vote in the United States. Yeah. But still, black Americans kept voting. Uh, another little story, I was about six. And I was coming home from school with my uncle. And there were long lines of black people waiting to vote. 
And um, I said, if those people all vote um, Uncle Alto, that man Wallace couldn't possibly win because I knew George Wallace wasn't good for black people. And my uncle said, oh no, we're the minority, he's going to win. I said, so why do they bother? Mm. And my uncle said, because one day they know that vote will matter. And I never forgot that and I haven't failed to vote once in my entire life. So we have to remember we have a history in the United States when uh, it yeah. wasn't so easy to vote. Absolutely, absolutely. As a daughter of an African American and a Central European who grew up under the Second World War, just the idea that both in two different countries far away, very similar experiences just didn't um, have any of those rights as early parts of their lives, but that's also what motivates us to fight for, um, for the rights that are so precious and dear. Um, let me, let me um, ask this one, Condi, that you know, obviously the United States is a strong democracy. We have heard and we've seen so much today about how strong our elections are. And January 6th was a reality um, for all of us, a day where both democracy did hold, but democracy came under very, very real threat yes. and threat that we had not seen in many, many years. If you can just comment on how do we process that and then also how do we talk about that when we are going around the world and when we're talking about the United States and its leadership role in the world. I cried on January 6th because I thought to myself, I, I study countries that do this. I don't live in a country that uh, does this. But uh, it, was, it was jarring and it was awful. And the peaceful transfer of power is the one thing that, ch that, uh, th that distinguishes democracy from authoritarians. One reason authoritarians are afraid of their people is there is no peaceful way to change power. And uh, to not have it recognized and to have it challenged, I thought was a very dark day in our history. But as you said, that night, when they filed into the Capitol after it was secured and in the most boring way possible, using archaic language, certified the election one by one state after another, I thanked my God that night for, uh, for Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and Mike Pence. It helped. <laughs> and and yeah. the truth of the matter is, when I go around the world, I tell people that democracy is not perfect. And there will be challenges to it. There may even be challenges by someone who doesn't respect it. But if your institutions are strong enough, yeah. then you can, uh, you can deal with that. And so uh, when you think about the institutions that the founders gave us, one of the most remarkable things, and we sometimes don't even realize it, uh, and it didn't work so well at the beginning of the union, but the president and the vice president are separately elected. So when you heard the call of roll call of states, it was Arkansas cast seven votes for Donald Trump and seven votes for Michael Pence. California folks has 37 votes for Joe Biden and 37 for Kamala Harris. Separately elected, the one person Donald Trump could not fire was Mike Pence. Uh -huh. And so our institutional design is really excellent. So get your institutional design right. And the other point I'd make about the importance of institutions is it gives people a place to appeal yeah. if an election is close or if they, uh, if they don't accept the outcome immediately. Bush v. Gore, when the Supreme Court finally spoke, people were willing to accept. And even in some other countries, I was in Kenya uh, in, uh, in Kenya in 2007, they had a very bad election along ethnic lines. 1,000 people died in the violence. Mm -hmm. I went there at President Bush's instruction uh, with Kofi Annan to uh, do a national unity government and we got one into the violence. Five years later, they had a bad election again. This time they said, we're taking it to the electoral court. That's, That's when institutions start to matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we think, oh, if there's a challenge or it goes to a court, that it's a terrible thing, but it's actually just democracy it's and democracy the process. At work. It's institutions yeah. at work because Absolutely. democracy is the institutionalization of freedom. Mm. Uh, our founders understood that you couldn't have what they would have called the voice of the mob, just everybody trying to apply their interest. So that's why we have elected representatives and that's why we have a constitution and that's why we have courts. That's why we have rule of law. Uh, democracy is a way of channeling uh, democratic passions. That's, that's a great lesson. Um, Natan, many look to the United States, for better or for worse, <laughs> on the model that we are to the rest of the world, and quite often they look when we have elections of what that means for well, the world. Well, just what Condi told about uh, how it was with black people, 
I can tell, in 1976, 200 years of American Revolution, somehow Soviet Union agreed with America to have a special exhibition about America. And there was, a, I already am a dissident, I have KGB tales, but I came and to watch the crowd. The entrance is not about what was done in space, about medicine, so it's simply the text of American constitution, and in freedom and in pursuit of happiness, or something like this, and the guide is explaining 200 years of elections, that all the time they, they're keeping it, and uh, all these different candidates, and how it's worked, and, and people stand in awe, mm. and then somebody shouting, but you're lynching black people. And it was more rude than black people, but uh, then there was a pause, but then a uh, guy started telling about the uh, civil rights movement and about Martin Luther King. And again, everybody did it. They're afraid to, to repeat it, because, uh, but, but they're admiring all the story. And, uh, and then somebody said, but you killed Martin Luther King. Mm. And then, it tells, yes, but we have our criminals, and, uh, and uh, these people then are punished, and all the societies against. Uh, and then it's telling about, about how today, uh, what, as a result of it, how voting system changed, and how, and I look on my, my KGB tales, but they are secret KGB, nobody knows that they are KGB. <laughs> uh, and I say, no, uh, what can you say? And uh, they, they tried to show me that, okay, we cannot say, but we, it's, it's really, it's something that you're looking up to this. Now, uh, in, uh, for us, for dissidents, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, are, we are fighting for human rights, but who cares how to make the world care? And it's clear that there is one country which, for which human rights, it's their center. Mm -hmm. And our hope is always of this country. And of course, even if this president, for example, doesn't appreciate enough the importance of linkage, if you remember that it was Nixon and Senator Jackson, our hero was Senator Jackson, and uh, Nixon didn't want this linkage, but it is democracy. If we will make this case popular enough, the next president, and then comes Carter. And we, I have to say, today I can, have, can say many critical things about Carter, but the fact that he, brought to the election human rights, and as if responding, we just now Helsinki Agreement, we created Helsinki Group, we are expecting that we will be arrested, and he speaks like our language, mm -hmm. and he sends the letter to Sakharov, I was the one who was connecting with him, as if we have, like, we dissidents have diplomatic relations mm -hmm. with America, which, for which human rights is important. It was so powerful, and then, of course, well, there were some disappointments with Carter, and then I'm in prison when there comes evil empire speech. Uh -huh. And that was the best day for me in prison because they, well, how we knew about it, because Soviet Union and all the newspapers was uh, condemning the United States of America. But so America understands the nature of communism. They, they, uh, if they, understand, they understand how weak this empire is because of the lack of human rights, everything. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the fact that American president, George Bush, met with more than 100 democratic dissidents, and I personally saw what the hope it gives. Yeah. Sadegin Ibrahim would be in prison forever mm -hmm. if America didn't care about human rights in Egypt. So, uh, well, I can only hope that, that uh, some, uh, the fall, those who followed uh, President Bush, both Democrats and Republicans, they had to continue this line, and it's not always. Uh, America, it's, in the end, it is the only hope. The only, because we don't have any other big fight uh, for uh, democracy and freedom. You have to understand, for, uh, the Ukraine now, the critical moment was when America finally got it that it is that it, she has to speak about the victory of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it is very critical how America is treating the 
concept of human rights and of its own elections. The fact that for 200 years you have this system which is working practically without any amendments. It's such an unbelievable example to all of us, including Israel. Yeah, yeah. Um, so your point is, is, is so important because it brings us also to the idea that um, the United States has allies around in every country in the world. They just may not be sitting in government. They may be sitting yeah. in jail. They may be sitting in the street or elsewhere, but they are freedom-loving people. But what we also know is many of the authoritarian governments um, feel threatened or don't like that the United States is so vocal yeah. and is an example. Um, what we have seen, and maybe Condi, if you can comment on this, what we've seen in so many places now is that one of the tools that authoritarians will use is misinformation or disinformation and sowing seeds of doubt in, um, in democracies. Now, we know American elections have been free and fair and they have been sound, but we also know that there are real threats at home and abroad. So maybe if you can speak a bit about what that looks like from an international standpoint, that threat of misinformation. Well, it's certainly one of the tools uh, that, in fact, authoritarians have used forever. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Stalin uh, used to talk about a fifth column within the United States, and by that meant he, he meant disaffected Americans who might be uh, somehow drawn to the Soviet cause. And so the idea was always there that you could stir trouble uh, among Americans because we're an open society and uh, you can't tell people don't listen to that because it might come from, uh, from an enemy. And so uh, the, it, it's always been there. What has multiplied its effect is social media, uh, the internet, uh, by the way, uh, bots. Uh, who can uh, multiply the efforts of authoritarians. So while the old misinformation game has been around for a long time, the efficiency of the misinformation game is now significantly greater than it was uh, in the past. And so how do we fight it? Well, the first thing that we do is that uh, we say, for instance, the interference in our elections in 2016, we say, shame on you the first time, shame on us if it happens a second time. Mm -hmm. And I do think that the uh, subsequent administrations and our law enforcement and our intelligence agencies have been much more attuned mm -hmm. to the problems of misinformation uh, in the United States and the effort to, to use disinformation. By the way, some of the Russian efforts were really pretty amateurish. <laughs> Uh, those, those were not Americans, and you could tell it immediately. And so uh, sometimes I wonder if they're, they're uh, always succeeding in what they're hoping to do, but it's something we have to fight against. Uh, we know that the Germans have been uh, very effective uh, at this. We know that the French have been effective. In some countries uh, that may have less capability in this regard, uh, there are some places, for instance, in Eastern Europe that have been quite affected uh, by it. I think we have to be uh, a kind of clearinghouse for best practices and, if necessary, assistance mm -hmm. in dealing uh, with, uh, with misinformation. The other thing is that uh, we can also flood authoritarians with the truth. Uh, everybody talks about the great days, uh, and I see Pat down there, the great days of Voice of America and, uh -huh. uh, and Radio for Europe, and they were great days. But Voice of America and Radio for Europe didn't spew propaganda. They just told the truth. And they told truth to a population that knew that they were not getting the truth. Mm -hmm. And so much of what we have to do, I was always asked, why doesn't the United States have better information operations? Or why don't we have a better public diplomacy? Well, I would say, first of all, the United States government's actually, unfortunately, not very good at it. <laughs> uh, and uh, what we are better at doing is allowing the multiple voices of America to be heard across the world, whether it's through American culture, American sports figures who are extremely mm -hmm. uh, well regarded, American business. One of the things that I always say to American business is, you may be the only American with whom people come in contact, so make sure that you treat people well, mm -hmm. that you treat them as if they were your own citizens, that you don't foul their environment, uh, that you make sure that their jobs are safe and secure, that's the best argument for democracy that we can make abroad. And so we have multiple ways to get those voices out. And then one final very good example. Uh, the Chinese government was lying to its people about the particulates in the air in Beijing. And uh, they were saying air quality was something that it was not. 
And we simply had an air quality meter outside of the American embassy that was showing <laughs> what the air quality actually was. And since Chinese citizens knew that they couldn't breathe in Beijing, they started relying on the American air quality monitor. Pretty soon the Chinese government had to start admitting that it had a problem. So uh, I think we can protect ourselves, but we can fight fire with fire, but our fire has to be the truth. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's the most powerful fire. Um, Natan, you were born in the former Soviet Union in what we now know as Ukraine. In Donetsk, no In no Donetsk, no Donetsk, no Donetsk, no Donetsk no the center of war today. Yes, which we should not forget has been under attack not since February, yes. but has been under attack since 2014 and yeah. prior to that. Um, and as was mentioned by President Bush, you know, Ukraine is a country, a, de a democracy, a developing democracy with a democratically elected leader that has been attacked by um, a non-democracy with an unelected leader. If you can just speak to what we're seeing in that region, what we're seeing about the power that the people are now putting, the confidence we're yes. putting in a democratic leader, and what it also means for the Russian people, those who are suffering greatly, as well as those who have been misled by an undemocratic leader. Well, Ukraine and Russia, in fact, is a good test example of exactly what we are talking about. After all, it was almost one country. I grew in Ukraine and then I studied in Moscow. It was uh, people shared families, shared everything. Uh, when it fell apart, there are many similar things which uh, happened, uh, very weak civil institutions, a lot of... Uh, uh, corruption, uh, joint venture between politicians and oligarchs, it was in both, in Russia and Ukraine. Wh where comes the difference? <laughs> in Russia, there were two presidents. In Ukraine, there were six presidents. <laughs> in Ukraine, the uh, right to vote is uh, like sec uh, sacred uh, right, and people are it, uh, very, very vibrant, and people are not happy with the president, they go to the streets, they demand, they write everything, and then they uh, elect another one. In Russia, Putin, uh, who was in fact uh, chosen by Yeltsin, the first president, immediately started, took control over the press, immediately simply two oligarchs who controlled TV and who in fact brought him to power. But the moment they started permitting their TV channels to, to, to criticize him, he simply uh, exiled them to get all the property. Then he made sure that oligarchs <coughs> will never give money to political opponents. So with Khodorkovsky, it was like a message to everybody. You support anybody but me, you lose all your property. And then uh, he took care of corrupt uh, 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 courts. So in the end, there is no free election. In Russia, in fact, in, in, in almost 20 years, and he needed to change twice constitution. He changed constitution to before. That by itself changed everything. He needs, as every dictator, to, to control the country, he needs the war. He needs enemy, external enemy. And, uh, and, the, and uh, he needs a mission for the people, and his own mission, uh, by the way, in the beginning, I met him a number of times at the beginning, he was looking for recognition. Mm -hmm. He wanted very much that Bush recognized mm -hmm. him. And then Merkel. Then with the time, he understood all these people are coming and leaving. He's the only one in the world who can be leader forever. He is the most powerful. And he has a mission for his people to restore not the communism, he is not interested in communism, but Russian empire, to bring back all these Russian lands. And for this, he needs also to say, well, people have to fight for some great idea. We are those who liberated people from Nazis. So we go against Nazis today. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there is very problematic, corrupt democracy, but which is, has a freedom of vote. They're voting every time for, and so, uh, the last episode, very interesting. Uh, 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 there, there is a very popular uh, Ukrainian uh, singer, Slava Vakarchuk, very popular. Uh, uh, suddenly, now in these days, he is, of course, traveling from one hospital to the other, and, and they see on CNN, uh, they're interviewing him. And they, they're telling, look, all the singers of the world, 
in order to express uh, solidarity, now they are singing the song for, and they are all in the flags of Ukraine, and they are singing what imagine of John Lennon. Mm -hmm. And then she's asked, no, what, what, what you feel? And she's very excited. And he's a little bit embarrassed, and, and he says, well, well, we are grateful for solidarity. We need your support. Please continue. Thank you. But I have to say that uh, to speak about the world without nations, that there is nothing to die for, we want world with free nations, mm -hmm. and we are ready to die for our nation. And that's, uh, well, I was very happy to hear it. I know him, well, believe me, he says it not because he read my books, but because <laughs> they, 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 they really feel they, they want a world of free nations and they're ready to fight and die for this. And that's the difference in this war between uh, Russian people uh, and uh, Ukraine. Absolutely. Connie, can we stay on that, on that topic, <coughs> which um, Natan has so, captured so well, which is the world is watching the Ukrainian people not flee, but run right back in because they are fighting for their nation. They know what's at risk. And you know, I spoke with a colleague who works for a democracy support organization. He said all of the all of the work that the United States has done to support the Ukrainians in building institutions and in civic education, those are the people who are choosing to stay, to say we will maybe not build institutions. Right now we'll document the atrocities so that we can get back to work of building institutions. Is this a moment where we're seeing a pivot? And what will that also mean for the United States? We're so polarized and, and worried about our democracy, and yet here is this example for us of what it means to really fight for those freedoms. Well, I, <clears throat> I hope that the first thing that it does is to remind people that the efforts that we've made to support those who wish to live in freedom uh, do pay dividends. Yeah. Uh, you hear so much, well, you can't impose freedom. No, that's right, you impose tyranny. And usually those people who are saying things like, well, those people don't care so much about freedom, they don't care about American values, uh, they're usually people who are living on the free side of the world <laughs> and uh, can therefore have that patronizing attitude towards those who are not free. Mm -hmm. So when I think about all that places like Freedom House and the National Endowment for Democracies and, and American universities that have, uh, have welcomed people and, and Europeans as well, uh, when I think about the history of the, uh, what was at the time called the Conference of, for Security and, uh, and Cooperation in Europe where many, many um, uh, dissidents and many uh, civil society uh, activists were brought and they learned from each other and they were ready to go in a sense. I think about the support we gave Solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. even under martial law. I think about the voice, as you put it, that we gave to the voiceless in sell yeah. jail sales. Maybe Americans can say, all right, now I know why we do that. Mm -hmm. Because there are people who are willing to stand up and fight for their freedoms, to fight for the right to live their lives as they wish to live them. And I also hope that it reminds us how incredibly fortunate we are. Mm -hmm. I'm really kind of sick and tired of grumpy Americans uh, <laughs> who are uh, grumpy about, uh, you know, well, our politics, uh, yeah, it's pretty awful sometimes. Well, our government, yes, it is sometimes uh, ineffectual. Uh, but we are so incredibly fortunate built on the uh, efforts and the backs of people who for generations fought for to keep these freedoms uh, before us. And so, and by the way, fought for the freedoms of others as well in Germany and in, in Japan and other places. And so uh, I hope that it will shake us a little bit out of uh, our, our sense that uh, the kind of pity party that we're sometimes having uh, that will remind ourselves what it really means to have to fight for your freedom and uh, that the Ukrainians will uh, make us recognize uh, how very fortunate we are and uh, that uh, from whom, uh, to whom a lot is given, uh, a lot is expected. Uh, one of the favorite uh, Bible phrases from uh, President Bush uh, because when I hear people say America should just mind its own business or uh, we have so much to do in Iowa, why are we caring about Afghanistan? Uh, that is beneath us as a people. Mm -hmm. It's beneath us as an idea. America is an idea. We're, we're not unified by ethnicity or nationality or religion. We're unified by an idea. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can come from humble circumstances. You can do great things. Uh, you, every person deserves to live in freedom. Mm -hmm. I, I, so we just, we have to keep up the fight. To, to continue, though, to finish this remark, I want to say, not only because America feels solidarity with people who want uh, freedom, but Ukraine and Russia, it's, all this war is not about peace of land, not about Donbass. Mm -hmm. It's about on what principles will be based mm -hmm. the free world, whether that world which was built after 1945, United Nations and the Helsinki Agreement and everything in order to make sure that if your neighbor is stronger than you, your freedom is not in danger. These principles are the big threat. And there is nobody in the world who can defend this principle mm -hmm. as a principle except America. That's why it is so important that America at some moment understood that Ukrainian victory is needed for us, for Americans, for the free world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well said, so well said. And I think as we look at elections in the United States and the United States' its role abroad, when we go to the ballot box, we are voting for our best policies or, 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 or positions, but we're also voting for people who will choose to keep our democracy strong and keep yeah. uh, the United States yeah. engaged in the world. And so in many ways, our, our ballot has many, many different purposes, right? It's not just about our policy on you know, local schools, although that's extraordinarily important. It is also about how we stand with, with other countries. Um, let me ask a, a, maybe a tough question. Um, as Secretary of State, um, I recall how many challenging elections took place during your tenure as Secretary of State, and some of which were free and fair elections or relatively free-ish, free fair-ish elections, but the outcomes did not bring liberal leaders, and I don't mean capital L, I mean leaders who were going to protect human rights or leaders who were gonna be committed to democratic values. How did you navigate that? How should the United States be thinking about that challenge of supporting the process and the outcome? Well, I think the thing to remember is that democracy is a process. It's not a point in time. And uh, so you have to get started somewhere. And frankly, I think getting started with elections is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a lot of elections are not going to be, uh, even if they are free uh, and more or less fair, and by the way, you can uh, work hard to help ensure that through uh, trying to argue for equal access to media, for instance, for candidates, uh, for trying to help countries through electoral support not to uh, un unlevel the playing field uh, by the rules by which elections are going to be taken. So there are legions of electoral experts <clears throat> from places like uh, the National Endowment for Democracy and the like that can help work on those technical aspects. But you also have to realize that uh, when you have weaker institutions, sometimes you'll get a very strong executive and then that very strong executive uh, will destroy the other institutions around them. That's a bit what happened with Boris Yeltsin. You know, he, he didn't really respect the parliament. He ruled by decree. And a strong president named Boris Yeltsin in Russia is one thing. A strong president named Vladimir Putin is quite another. Mm -hmm. And so you try to encourage that the institutions matter, not just that single election. And then when you get an outcome that you don't like, you have to agree to live by it. Mm -hmm. So I remember when the Palestinians uh, had their elections in 2006, and I will never have to forget having to make that call to President Bush when we learned that actually <laughs> Hamas had won. Um, and uh, well, now what do we do? Well, we said we will respect the election, yeah. but we still have some requirements. Uh, you have to accept what, by the way, the Palestinians had agreed to, that Israel has a right to exist that you will live up to the agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't have to support Hamas, but we did have to support the will of the people. And I think you have to be willing to do that. But I also think remembering that uh, if you have multiple elections over time, sometimes things get better. I remember very well when the Kuwaiti women were allowed to run for office for the first time, and not a single one of them won. And they were so down. And I was in Kuwait shortly after that. And I said, you know, I said, you have to keep trying. And I realized that they only campaigned among women. And I said, you know, uh, <laughs> there are not enough of you. You've got to get some men to vote for you, too. And sure enough, the next time around, uh, some of them got elected. And they sent me a t-shirt that said, half a democracy is not a democracy at all. 
And so try to remember that uh, sometimes these things take time as much as you can do to make the first opportunity a good one, the first outcome's a good one. But for goodness sakes, don't be scared off about elections because the outcome might not be the, wish you, the one you would wish. Absolutely, and such a great reminder that it is a moment in time, but it is also the governance that comes after it. It's yes. such an important moment, but also. But, uh, uh, going back to 2006 and our disagreement with our American friends, <laughs> and we were, I personally was in White House the day of elections, yeah. warning, don't call it free democratic, because they're not free and democratic. Hamas will win, and, uh, and it will be terror, and what is the result of free democratic? This, this is not only elections themselves, but there must be civil institutions right. which accompany it, and that's why what America is so important, not only by the fact that every four years it has elections, but it has very powerful civil institutions which guarantee these elections. Which we so, saw, which we saw in January 6th. And, and by the yeah, way, exactly, that's how that's I, I agree with you completely. One of the reasons that Hamas won yeah. was because Fatah was so corrupt. Yeah, absolutely. And so it, it was I, the reason. It, it the was reason. the reason that yeah. they won. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Natan, you spoke about um, supporting human rights activists, supporting yeah. dissidents, and you also told, talked about the important voice that one million Soviet Jews played in, in yeah. forming an interest group, in essence. Yeah. Um, can you just speak about what the role and responsibility is of democracies, particularly the United States, in supporting those voices of human rights defenders around the world? Well, first of all, it's uh, good to remember, like today with Ukraine and Russia, that supporting democratic dissidents, it's not only because it is a noble thing to do and we love them, but <laughs> because it's our interest, it's, it's our real partners. Let's say dictators, we have to sign with them some agreements, we have to, to, to work on uh, not, not letting the war, but our real partners in building the future world are democratic dissidents. And the main condition of their survival is that the dictators know that the world watches, that you will have to pay a big price in your economy, in your uh, military, in, in everything if you, uh, uh, if you kill them. And in many cases, uh, uh, Saladin Ibrahim would never be released by Mubarak if President Bush didn't put all the might of, uh, of, uh, of, of everything. Uh, Soviet Union could still exist mm. if Soviet Jewry movement, by far the most massive dissident movement, Soviet Union didn't turn into, uh, from the day one. It was a struggle of all American Jews and then of American uh, democracy and uh, American, and uh, also Europe. Uh, Margaret Thatcher played a big role, but, uh, S simply, dictators would never, uh, they, they understand, the, the dictators understand the danger of uh, uh, dissidents. On the other hand, they understand the da danger of confrontation mm -hmm. with uh, powers like America. So each time they're balancing between these two dangers. And uh, uh, America had to, to, to remember that the, the real, not only the future, the future of these people, but in fact, the stability of the world in which we live depends on the fact how much solidarity you as a country, as a civil society, as, a, as a senators and congressmen, how, uh, uh, how much support you're ready to give to these people. Excellent. Let me have this as our final question to both of you. We're at an event talking about elections. The United States is entering into, or we'll have midterms and then a presidential election in two years. The world has a number of elections and the world is both watching us as well as waiting for that solidarity. What advice or what final words would you say um, in that context, both to Americans who are looking at our elections as well as thinking about engaging the world and then Natan as well? Well, to Americans, I would just say, I li heard a little bit of President Bush say, you, you have to participate, you have to vote. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't vote, you haven't raised your voice, and so then don't complain. <laughs> and so uh, I feel very strongly about the, the right to vote and the responsibility to vote, although I've never favored uh, having compulsory elections. Uh, I think people ought to take the choice to vote. 
Uh, I would say when we approach the world, yes, I keep hearing about the democratic recession, and yes, there are a lot of places where we've seen democracy go backwards, Turkey, Hungary, other places. But you know, in the long run, authoritarians are weak. And they're weak for a couple of reasons. One is they fear their own people, uh, because they don't have a pulse on what their people feel. Uh, secondly, uh, because, uh, they, because they become a single point of failure. And all of a sudden, you know, we have this authoritarian envy sometimes. They can build great airports, yes. Well, they also had a one-child policy that now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. And they had a zero COVID policy, which hasn't turned out to be too brilliant either. So maybe, maybe they're not actually all that smart after all. And so we, uh, and, and the final thing I'll say about them is they are brittle. Uh, there is a moment that we learned about when we were visiting Romania, um, and it, I've called it ever since the Ceausescu moment. We were standing in this square in uh, Romania, and the Romanians were saying to us, this is where Ceausescu had addressed 250,000 Romanians. Uh, the revolutions were going on in the Czech Republic and in Poland and all over the place, and he stood and he was telling the Romanian people what he had done for them. And he said, they said, all of a sudden, one old woman yelled liar. And then 10 people, and then 1,000, and then 100,000 people are yelling liar. And now Ceausescu realizes yeah, that what had been fear has simply turned to unbridled anger. Yeah. Yeah. And so he turned to run. He and his wife were captured by the revolution and executed. Yeah. The Ceausescu moment will eventually come yeah. for every dictator. Yeah. And we have to keep that in mind, too. Yeah, yeah it was exactly repeated in Egypt after the yes. Mubarak, exactly yes. the same. Yes. Well, I, I, look, I don't want to interfere into uh, American elections. We have enough <laughs> headache with our uh, We've and, got a lot who yeah, are trying. But, but I want to say, the, uh, it's, of course, it's, it's good to have good leaders elected. But no less important is to keep your unique system Mm -hmm. which you created, which for 200 years is working like clock to keep in place. The system which produces all these good leaders. That's all of that. Excellent. Well, please join me and thank you, our two extraordinary guests. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive director of the George W. Bush Institute, Holly Kuzmich. Well, what a great way to close our program with remarks from President Bush and that outstanding panel uh, with Secretary Rice and Natan Sharansky. It was great to ground that discussion with the global perspective as we talk about our own democracy. Uh, all of our speakers today really helped illustrate not just the current state of our elections, but what we can do to secure their future. So while we love to talk about issues, what we love even more is when there's important ways to act going forward. And that's why the Bush Institute is a member of the Partnership for American Democracy and was keen on hosting this first event in the More Perfect series. And I want to highlight on behalf of my friend, John Bridgeland, um, who is a coalition builder, and you're about to hear how he's a coalition builder in all these announcements I'm going to read. All of the commitments this event helped prompt. You heard of several of them, but there are many, many more. Issue one is launching Count Every Vote, a cross-partisan three-year program to reestablish faith in America's elections, support election workers, and secure more federal funding for election administration and ballot security. Represent Us is working with local community leaders to organize bipartisan community groups through Protect Pennsylvania elections and Protect Wisconsin elections. Interfaith America will activate the social capital of higher education and faith communities across the nation with something called Vote is Sacred, a program to underscore the centrality of the vote in a religiously diverse democracy. The People is creating peace at the polls an initiative to marshal volunteers and others in the civic space to speak up and advocate for peace throughout the election and governing process. We the Veterans is launching Vet the Vote, a national campaign to recruit 100,000 veterans and military family members to become the next generation of poll workers. Civic Nation is recruiting 5,000 attorneys to volunteer their time to ensure trusted elections in 2022. 
And American Promise is launching Combating Foreign Influence in U.S. Elections, which is a bipartisan effort to support state ballot initiatives and federal initiatives to eliminate foreign government influence in state and federal elections. That's a long list, but it tells you about the important work that will be happening going forward. And I know many of the presidential centers around the country, including ours, are supporting these efforts to strengthen our democracy. We also have representatives, as you heard Ken Hurst mentioned before, from the Obama Foundation, from the Reagan Foundation, from the Carter Foundation, from the LBJ Foundation. We're glad they're all here and joining us in this important work. Let's give a round of applause to all of those commitments that were made today. And then once again, on behalf of the Partnership for American Democracy, I wanna thank all the people who fund this important work. They launched with founding support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Skoll Foundation and the Walmart Foundation, three organizations that share a commitment to advancing democratic renewal and who have announced renewed commitments to the shared work. So I wanna thank in particular, we heard from Stephen Heinz today, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Office of American Possibilities for announcing $10 million in, fund, in funding for the Trust for Civic Infrastructure, Pat Harrison and Michael Levy at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting for the more than $1.4 million in support of the American Amplified Journalism Initiative and for its Remaking America Initiative, to Natalie Tran at the CIA Foundation and Civic Alliance and Michael Carney at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation for their efforts to ensure that employees are able to fully participate in elections as voters and poll workers. And we've got several other commitments. The Walmart Foundation has made two investments totaling $1 million made primarily in support of bridge building work. Their most recent investment will help scale initiatives that bridge political and cultural divides in two sectors, higher education and libraries. Uh, the Skoll Foundation, Don Gipps, Bruce Lowry, and Tim Carlberg have pledged $500,000 to a new community election protection program to provide support to community leaders in vulnerable jurisdictions. The Lilly Endowment, Clay Robbins, for their $250,000 investment that will engage the faith-based community in shoring up our democracy. Karen and Gary, Jerry Goldberg for launching a new fund at the Jewish Community Foundation of Greater Hartford to, to advance more perfect national service and volunteering goals. Collectively, these initiatives amount to $30 million in new philanthropic investment. They will go to frontline institutions making progress on the Partnership for American Democracy's five sustainable democracy goals. Finally, I wanna thank all of the partners here today, our partners from the presidential centers, um, and I wanna highlight that the next event in this series, the next action-forcing event to move the sustainable democracy goals forward is gonna be on civic learning. It will be September 9th at the Ronald Reagan Library in California. So I wanna thank you all again to our partners, our speakers. I wanna thank our team here at the Bush Center in particular, Chris Walsh, David Kramer, Kristen King, Sarah Gibbons, many others who helped put on this event. And my last charge to all of us is they wanted, the founders wanted us to celebrate democracy too. So join us outside the auditorium for a reception to end our program. Thank you all. Thank you.